like that. It's really good study. I'd encourage you, second service, fireside room. Well, we are almost at the end of our summer in the Psalms. Uh, next Sunday, Lord's Day, Lord willing, will be Psalm 12 and our final psalm together before we start our next series for this fall. But this morning we find ourselves in Psalm 11. And if you've been traveling along with us in our time in the Psalms, you know that many, actually almost all, of the Psalms that we have seen this summer are about lament and sorrow and trials. And this Psalm is no different. This Psalm assists us in understanding how the Lord works in our lives. Well, without further ado, I want to read and set the whole text before us, pray, and then we will get into the message this morning. So if you look along, Psalm 11, beginning in verse 1. To the choir master of David. In the Lord I take refuge. How can you say to my soul, flee like a bird to your mountain? For behold, the wicked bend the bow. They have fitted their arrow to the string. They shoot in the dark at the upright in heart. If the foundations are destroyed... What can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes see, his eyelids test the children of man. The Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. Let him rain coals on the wicked, fire and sulfur and a scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds. The upright shall behold his face. Well, that is the word of the Lord. Let's look to him together in prayer. Father, we thank you that we can boldly approach the throne of grace in all of your glorious righteousness because you have covered us and cleansed us with the redeeming blood of Jesus Christ. And we pray this morning that your spirit would move among us to make attentive, make us attentive to your word preached and sung and prayed and seen in the supper later. We pray that your spirit would illuminate your word and that your word would not return void, but accomplish all of your purposes, which we pray this morning is to bless and build your church by saving the lost, by strengthening the weak, encouraging the faint-hearted, and for all of us that we would be made more into the image of Jesus. To that end, Lord, would you let the words of my mouth, the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer, and all of God's people said, amen. Amen. The relentless pressure, the relentless condescension from her professor shook her to the depths of her soul, week after week, going to class, snide remarks, comments, everything this professor said undermined, attempted to undermine her belief in Jesus. Was Jesus really true? Is Jesus who the Bible says he is? Should she devote her life to him and his word and follow Jesus to the ends of the earth? Or should she follow what seemed intelligent, certainly forceful, teachings of her professor and her classmates. The same can be said about the coercion from his boss and his co-workers to cave and to agree with their anti-Jesus understanding. They were in a small group together. He was at a crossroads in his young life. He didn't know what to do. His Christian friends offered their advice and counsel to him, but he noticed over the weeks that they never opened their Bibles. They said things to him that weren't familiar to him from Scripture, and when they did give him counsel, they weren't appealing to the Bible, and so over time, at first, it seemed wise for him. It sounded like a good idea. Take their counsel and make that decision at his, at his crossroads. It seemed wise at first, but he, he wasn't so sure. He knew that his Christian friends were well-meaning, but over time, as he reflected on what they said on these major decisions that would chart the course of his life from his perspective, 
it seemed that their counsel was moving him further away from trusting in Jesus and relying on him. What should he do? We live in a world. Christians have always lived in a world, but we uniquely in our day and age live in a world full of temptations, full of pressures, full of confusions that serve to take our eyes off of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We live in a world full of false counsel and fake saviors. Scroll through social media, and whether it's even from believers or unbelievers, we are offered promises of rest and salvation and comfort, but in ways that will always let us down. We turn into idols and functional saviors, our work, our school, our education, our degrees, our bank account, our relationships, sex, drugs, alcohol, anything and everything. Even the Christian can be tempted to turn them into functional saviors who temporarily seem to deliver us from trouble and woe, sorrows and suffering, but actually just make all our problems worse because none of them are Jesus. None of them are sturdy enough to save. The mantras of this age that overwhelm us and they're unceasing. You do you. Be true to yourself. Follow your heart. Let your authentic self out. And that you can do no wrong except for say someone else is wrong. And all of those are wrong and they're not true. And even Christians can succumb to those temptations that, that begin to get us off course by one degree from following Jesus. And then after days, weeks, months, and years, suddenly we're so off course we don't know where we are. We live in a world that wants to undermine your faith and fealty to Jesus Christ and his kingship. And whether it's by temptations, even from well-meaning Christians or taunts from enemies to leave Jesus. Psalm 11 serves us this morning as a breach of sunlight through the dark clouds of cultural confusion. And Psalm 11 helps us cling to God in Christ as our only refuge and hope. Psalm 11, this morning, strengthens our trust in the Lord. Psalm 11 motivates us to live righteous lives. Psalm 11 motivates us even when surrounded by enemies and evildoers, or even well-meaning but bad counsel from Christians, Psalm 11 is a north star that points us to Jesus and to not lose our navigation. So if you're taking notes this morning, the sermon comes in two parts. Here they are. Point number one, take refuge in Jesus and resist temptations and taunts to forsake him. That's verses one through three. And next... Take refuge in Jesus and rejoice that the Lord tests the righteous but hates the wicked. That's verses 4 through 7. Well, let's jump right in. Join me again at the first three verses of our text. Point number one, take refuge in Jesus. Resist temptations and taunts to forsake him. Listen again to the beginning of this Psalm of David. In the Lord I take refuge. How can you say to my soul, flee like a bird to your mountain? For behold, the wicked bend the bow. They have fitted the arrow to the string to shoot in the dark at the upright in heart. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Again, take refuge in Jesus, resist temptations and taunts to forsake him. As we look at these first three verses, I need to point out, at the beginning, two interpretive complexities. Two things that if you read commentaries or even spend time reading the psalm, there's two questions that come out. The first, it's not clear where the quote ends. What do I mean? Well, if you look at verse 1, how can you say to my soul, and then your text likely has a quote Flee like a bird to the mountain. And my ESV ends the quotation at the end of verse 3. 
But there are other translations, maybe you have one in your lap, such as the New King James or more, ends the quote somewhere else. What's the point? It's not entirely clear in the Hebrew when the quote ends of the bad thing that someone is saying to David, and then David's narration begins again. It's not entirely clear, but my ESV takes it down to verse 3. So our, for our, our purposes will take the quote there. But here's the second thing that makes it a bit complex to understand. And to see why. Who is David quoting? You can read some commentaries and they are certain that David is quoting the taunts of his enemies against him. And then you can read other commentaries and they are certain that it's actually friendly counselors to David who are giving him bad counsel. So either way, David's getting bad counsel. We don't know if it's coming from good guys or bad guys, so to speak. So you can choose. Either way, the main idea that we see in these opening verses, whoever is speaking, it comes to us in that very first verse. Whatever the circumstances are, we don't know. Something bad is happening. David's life is in danger. Whoever is speaking to David, here's what we know. They are discouraging David from taking refuge in the Lord. That is what is taking place here. And in that sense, whatever David's circumstances are, friends, we're going to see the same happens to us even on a daily basis. Either outright, overt, or covert, it happens to us. Either way, David is being discouraged from taking refuge in the Lord. Don't do that, these people are saying to him. And instead, they want him to take refuge in someone or something else. David reveals in these opening words that he is being tempted or taunted to forsake the Lord and instead to find refuge in someone or something other than the triune God. They tell David, flee like a bird to your mountain. Go to the place where your God dwells Maybe you'll be safe there. That's why these opening words are so powerful and potent, because David is having none of it. David says his emphatic statement right there in the beginning, in the Lord I take refuge. It's almost that his words are a shield counteracting against these bad words of these people speaking to him. In the Lord I take refuge. How can you say to me, fly like a bird to your mountain? So whether it's temptation from friends or taunt from enemies, David responds with a rhetorical question. How can you say something so foolish to me? I take refuge in the Lord. Why? There is no other refuge. The Lord is our only refuge. But what does that mean? I wonder if you were sitting down with a friend over coffee and you were to counsel them to take refuge in the Lord and they and that sounds beautiful. It's poetic. It's a lovely image. We, we can see, just picture David running from Mad King Saul or his son Absalom in the wilderness. And, and David is finding refuge in a cave. And here you were told, take refuge in the Lord. How do you actually do that? It sounds beautiful, but what does that mean? Well, to take refuge in the Lord means that you believe God. You believe the word of the Lord. You trust the power of his spirit. You cling to, his, to the promises and provisions of Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended, that you trust God more than anything else. To find refuge in the Lord means, as we often point out, that you trust the Lord more than what your eyes see. You trust the Lord more than what your heart feels. And you trust the Lord more than what your mind thinks. You believe his word and his promises more than everything else outside of you and even inside of you is saying when it tempts you or taunts you to move away. We take refuge in the Lord by believing him in his word. Now for David, if it's his enemies speaking, they're taunting David. They're using intimidation and fear. They're trying to sow doubt and disbelief in David's heart. 
They want David to distrust God. They want David to leave God's word. In essence, saying, your God is not true. Your God cannot save. Your God cannot see. That's what the enemies might be saying. And if it's David's friends, if it's his fellow covenant members, his counselors, his trusted advisors, maybe family, we don't know, but if it's, if it's people who are fellow believers speaking to him, they're giving him bad counsel. And they would be tempting him through their pragmatism. They pull out their calculators, their charts and graphs. They pull out the topographical maps. David's life is in danger. And it looks like the best course of action, what makes sense the most, is for you to fly like a bird, startled from the bush, go to the mountain. It's kind of like Job's friends. Well-meaning all along, seeming to give biblical counsel to Job. Something's got to be wrong with Job for this to be happening in his life. But in the end, we find out they're entirely wrong. And so even these temptations of David's friends, perhaps unintentionally, assuming the best, they are sowing doubt and disbelief in David's heart. They are sowing distrust of God and God's word. Either way, we have Psalm 11 sitting here. And what we discover is that in the depths of his soul, the effect of these words, taunt or temptations, is to try to get David... To find rest and relief in someone or something other than God in Christ. And David's circumstances are distressing enough. They're confusing enough. They're complex enough that it might even seem like a real possibility. Now, was there a temptation in his heart to listen to that counsel and to follow it? Well, certainly, maybe. But then he writes Psalm 11 and he certainly rejects what is said. That's it. in this situation. Maybe he's tempted to think maybe the Lord won't come through. Maybe it's best to take matters into his own hands. Maybe it's better to take the counsel that he's hearing. Maybe there's better wisdom somewhere else. So flee like a bird to the mountains. For behold, the wicked bend their bow. They have fitted the arrow to the string to shoot in the dark at the upright in heart. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? David is about to get shot. And if this is from his taunters, his enemies speaking, do you see what they're telling him to do? Run away, little bird. And as his back is to the bad guys, they knock the arrow, bend it to shoot David in the dark, in the back. It's the tactics of the wicked. More broadly, David's life is in danger of falling apart, and there's two paths set before him. And this is where it begins to relate to our lives. There's two paths before David. He can seek refuge in God against everything that's outside of him. Maybe even what his eyes see. He's being tempted to not find refuge in God. He can seek the path of finding refuge in the Lord or refuge on his own terms. And this is where Psalm 11 comes to our rescue because daily we face the same thing. We may not be running for our life like David was or may not be literal arrows pointed at our backs, but you and I, all of us, face times and seasons in our lives where enemies of the gospel want to embarrass you for being a Christian, want to shame you for loving Jesus, want to cancel you for following the Bible, want to coerce you from not standing firm on the solid rock that is Jesus. There are enemies of the gospel that want to silence you from speaking the truth in love, from making disciples of all nations. We live in a world that is against everything that Jesus is and who he is as truly God and truly man, and what he has done for us. All of us face times and seasons where even well-meaning Christians give you bad counsel. Because in those amnesiac moments of theirs, they're not thinking about what the Bible says. They're thinking about what seems right in their own eyes. It's possible that it can come from parents, 
friends, family, co-workers, even from people that we are in covenant with at church, there can be times when even well-meaning Christians inadvertently give us bad counsel that unintentionally leads us to functionally rely less on God's word and more on human wisdom. And that's where Psalm 11 both sobers us and strengthens us, whether temptations or taunts, will you, my dear friend, find refuge in the person, promises, and provisions of Jesus Christ, or will you find them in someone or something else? Tomorrow is Monday, and for many of you, you start school again. I know that the middle schoolers and high schoolers have already started school, but you college students, your faith will be taunted when you set foot on campus. It's going to be taunted by people who think you are a fool and backwoods bigot because you believe the Bible and follow Jesus. You are going to be tempted to abandon Jesus, to hide his truth under your bed. Do you know his word such that you can spot lies and deceptions if you are coerced in the classroom, if you read the article in the newspaper, if you're pressured to join the demonstration or whatever it is? Do you know the word of God so that you can spot even misguided and unwise counsel from well-meaning Christians? Some of you are freshmen. And this is your first time that you're moving out of your home, moving into the dorm or wherever you're going to be. What will you do when they say to you, I know the Bible says not to be unequally yoked with an unbeliever, but it's okay for you to date him. What are you going to do when they say, yeah, go out with her. She's hot. Where will you find refuge When they say to you that the Bible is wrong, and Jesus is wrong, your church is wrong, you are wrong, and you're wrong about there only being two genders. You're wrong that sexuality is only for marriage between a man and a woman. You're wrong that there is such a biblical thing as masculinity and femininity. You're wrong that there's such a thing as sin. You're wrong that there's such a thing as hell and heaven. You were wrong that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through him. What will you do? Friend, take refuge in the Lord, even if they are bending a bow to shoot you in the back. It is better to die for Jesus than to live for the enemy of your souls. How will you respond when even well-meaning Christians, and dare I say, college parachurch ministries, How will you respond when the local church is treated as unimportant and you're discouraged from being a part of one and even making Sunday a priority in your week, even over school? How will you respond? Where will you take refuge? And listen, we can say the same things for those of us, those of you who work for a living. I know many of your stories about the coercion that you are faced to wear the pin, to put the sticker on, to sign your name on the board at work. All the things that we are faced, whether it's from Christians or non-Christians, there are temptations to not find refuge in the Lord. And I want you to know that all of us need to be prepared beforehand to follow great David's greater son, Jesus Christ, and to take refuge in Jesus and his scriptures with the fellow saints whether you're tempted or taunted to forsake the Lord. There's a lot more to say on this point. But for that, I just want you to say that we, as we follow David, who follows Jesus, we need to take refuge in Jesus and resist temptations and taunts to forsake him. But next, point number two, take refuge in Jesus and rejoice in the Lord who tests the righteous but hates the wicked. Join me in verse 4. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. 
His eyes see, his eyelids test the children of man. The Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. Let him, that's the Lord, rain coals on the wicked, fire and sulfur, and a scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds. The upright shall behold his face. Here we see why verse 1 is written in our Bibles. This is the firm and solid, unshakable, unbreakable foundation that David can open his salvo of words by saying, In the Lord I take refuge. Here we see why David has resists, rather, the taunts and temptations to forsake the Lord. It's because he knows the Lord in whom he takes refuge. Look at verse 4. Do you see where the Lord is, as it were? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. It's not on that mountain to where David was going to fly like a bird. That mountain is his footstool. The Lord is seated in the heavenlies. The Lord right now, right in this moment, our resurrected and ascended, seated Jesus is comfortably relaxed on the throne of his universe, over which his eyes search all things. And even if he blinks, so to speak, He still never stops seeing all things all at once, all the time. The Lord is not confused. That's why the Lord takes refuge. That's why David takes refuge in him. The Lord is not unstable. That's why you can take refuge in him. The Lord is not uncertain. That's why you can take refuge in him. None can stop Jesus' gospel plan from unfolding. That's why you can take refuge in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There is none on earth, angelic or human, that can stop or stay the grace of God in Christ administered by His Spirit. That's why you can take refuge in Him. The gates of hell will not ever, cannot ever prevail against Jesus' church, even in times of persecution or bad counsel. And that's why you can take refuge in Jesus. David can take refuge in the Lord and in the word of the Lord because the Lord is unfazed and unmoved by everything that phases me and moves me and phases you and moves you. That's why David takes refuge in the Lord. And more than that, in verse 5, the Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. This is a beautiful verse. It's beautiful for many reasons. David takes refuge in the Lord because he knows that his good covenant God tests God's covenant people. What does that mean? Uh, If you're like me, every time I hear this word, the first thing that comes to mind is a pass-fail test like we get in school. But that's that's not what this means. It's not what this means. Because if it was a pass-fail test of how good you're doing at following the Lord, well, we would all get a good F on that test. And then if you're like me, you would have this low-grade belief that God is always disappointed with how bad you are at being a Christian. Is that what it means that the Lord tests the righteous, which means that we really are unrighteous and therefore failures and under his wrath and part of the wicked? What does it mean? No, often in the Bible, testing means to purify. Think maturing. Think making us more like Jesus. That God has an active plan in his testing of the righteous, of his covenant people. Why does David say this in Psalm 11? Why would David say these things to us to remind us of the Lord's testing of the righteous here in this psalm? What does that have to do with people telling you they're going to shoot you in the back 
as you run away from them. Why would he say that in this context? I want to suggest the reason David says it here, as he has in previous Psalms, is that the context means that there is a connection between God's testing of the righteous, his maturing of us, his shaping us to be like Jesus. There's a connection of the testing of the righteous and evil people trying to get you away from Jesus or even well-meaning Christians inadvertently taking you away from Jesus. There's a connection between those two. What's that connection? The connection, I would suggest, is that God uses these evil things in our life and trials for our good. And that even the temptation and pressure that you face to deny Jesus actually strengthens your faith in Jesus. And if you're tempted to move away from him, from well-meaning but misguided Christians, but you choose to follow Jesus' word against their bad counsel, that strengthens your roots in the word of God. God uses troubles and trials for your good always. We have seen over and again these weeks this summer that God uses sufferings and sorrows, troubles and trials, temptations and taunts only for your good. There's the beauty and grace of following Jesus. That even the hardships in our life, they make us practically, rather God uses them. He works in and through them without being guilty of sin or any wrongdoing on his part. God works in them for your righteousness, meaning making you more and more like Jesus practically daily in your lives. We worship and serve a God who wastes nothing for which we say, praise God. There is not a trouble in your life that he overlooks. Remember his eyes that see all things? So he has one eye, so to speak, on those who are doing bad to you and one good eye, so to speak, on you for your good. David knows from his Old Testament perspective that the temptations and taunts to forsake the Lord is a hard hand of discipline in a good way in his life from the Lord to glorify the Lord and increase David's capacity to enjoy the Lord and it's the same for you. I know you because you're like me. That is, we all live in this world. And we all walk in the door this morning with pockets full of sorrows, trials, taunts, and temptations, whatever it is. We live in this fallen world. There's always going to be something either in us or outside of us that's trying to move us away from Jesus. And yet this text, Psalm 11, helps us by reminding that no, the hardships are not a sign that God is against us in life, but that God is working in our life for his glory and our good. Don't forget. And we forget. And so Psalm 11 helps us. Do you know that? Are you fortified by this biblical truth that God uses everything against you because he is for you? He is for us in Christ. You see, the text says also, not just that he tests the righteous, but that he hates the wicked. I know that's a, can you shake that verse out of your Bibles? It's supposed to be in there. Maybe that's just like a bad Old Testament verse. No, it's a good Old Testament verse because it's a good Bible verse. God is at war with those who unrepentantly sin against him. And don't believe in him and trust his saving son. God is at war, and it's a war that he will most assuredly win, and his kingdom will reign. Words like these, when David puts that God is, is, well, this stance he has with the wicked, that he hates the wicked. What does this mean? Words like these do two things for us. They scare the wicked into repenting. And joining the side that wins. It scares the wicked into repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. And the other function of these words is to strengthen believers. 
who have those who are shooting at their backs and tempting them to leave Jesus, that it reminds us that God hates the wicked and he will judge them most assuredly on that last day. And that the, the sad irony in this psalm, Psalm 11, is this picture of David fleeing to the mountain, which he says he's not going to do, but that the wicked are going to bend the bow and shoot David in the back in the dark. But we've already heard of bow bending back in Psalm 7. This is the irony. In Psalm 7, we learn that God is a just judge who is angry with the wicked every day, and that he is wetting, he is sharpening his sword, and he's bending his bow, he's testing its strength, and he's lighting the arrow on fire because he is going to shoot the wicked. That's the irony, is the wicked think that their plans will prevail against Jesus and his gospel, and therefore Jesus' people, but God has a sword that he is sharpening and a bow that he is bending. The arrow is knocked, and if the wicked do not repent, they will perish eternally in the lake of fire. Sin against God and disbelief in his word is a declaration of war against God. You, friend, listen, I, these are, this is the bad news that you need to hear if you're not a follower of Jesus. This is why we call him a savior, because he saves us from God's wrath and incurred against our sin against him. Sin against God, disbelief in his word, is a functional declaration of war. So if you would have interviewed me at the age of 21 and before, I wouldn't have said, I'm at war with God. But God would have said, yes, you are. Yes, you are. Why? Because I didn't care about him. I did what was right in my own eyes and not his. And in doing so, incurred sin against him and more. But when you find out there's grace in these words, if you aren't a follower of Jesus and then you hear these sobering and scary and frightening, eternally frightening words that God hates the wicked, it is supposed to be a, a splash of cold water in our face to wake us up to know that, wait, I, I don't want to be against, at war against God. I didn't realize that my sin was so sinful. I want to renounce those sins, put them off and believe in Jesus and be saved. Friend, this is a war you cannot survive and you will not win, but you can change sides. And you can swear allegiance to the good King Jesus. And that's what's in those verses. Verse 6, it keeps going. Where David calls for the Lord to rain coals on the wicked. Fire and sulfur coming down from the heavens. A scorching wind shall be a portion of their cup. It's like treating them like Sodom and Gomorrah. And David, what is he doing? David takes refuge in verse 1. Because verses 5 and 6 are in this psalm. David takes refuge because he knows the Lord sits on his good throne, tests those whom he loves, will crush the unrepentant wicked because the Lord is himself righteous. There's no spot or blemish or wrong or sin or folly or anything. There is nothing unperfect in our good God. And he only does what is good, right, and perfect. And so for God to hate the wicked who don't repent is good, right, and beautiful about God. And we discover, though, in that last beautiful verse, verse 7, the Lord is righteous, he loves righteous deeds, the upright shall behold his face. David knows that even if he dies for the Lord by getting shot in the back by the bad guys, David knows that the upright shall see God's face. But I want to suggest something to you. Is David going to see the Lord's face because he's so good at being good? Is David going to see the Lord's face? Is he upright because he's so good at being upright, so good at being righteous? Well, friends, what David exposes to us in the psalm is that you would be mistaken and I would be mistaken to think that I am powerful enough and I am wise enough to resist temptations and taunts on my own accord and to dodge the arrows that are fiery being shot at my back in the dark. I'm not, and you're not. 
This is not a psalm about great David. This is a psalm about great David's greater son, Jesus Christ. David can't do it, and you can't do it. You see, you'd be mistaken to think that you can preserve yourself through the Lord's testing. You would think that you would be mistaken to think that the ingenuity is within yourself. You'd be mistaken to think that Psalm 11 encourages you to trust yourself. It doesn't. You'd be mistaken to think that Psalm 11 encourages you to trust your own abilities to take refuge in the Lord. Aha, uh-huh, that's a lie. I shall take refuge in the Lord. No. It is the Lord through and through, we, left to ourselves, trusting ourselves, even relying on our church in ourselves, we will always fail. But there is one you can trust, and there is one who has not failed. You see, when God became flesh in Jesus Christ, truly God and truly man, Jesus received taunts from his enemies like no other human being who has ever lived. And Jesus received temptations from his friends like no one who has ever lived. Jesus is the par excellence, true God and true man who has been taunted and tempted and went through both following his father. And he did it, Jesus did, all for us. You see, Psalm 11 is not ultimately about us. It's about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And this is truly his psalm. This is what he could sing, and he could pray on those prayer nights all through the night to his Father. And this is a prayer that you can pray only if you are found in Jesus. Then this is our psalm too. It's our psalm as well. Hebrews 2, verses 17 and 18. Therefore, Jesus had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that Jesus might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service to God to make propitiation, to satisfy God's wrath, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted. And therefore, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Are you tempted this morning? I know you are. I know you will be this week. So is the resources in yourself to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps and resist that temptation? No, it is God himself who became flesh in his son, Jesus Christ, and he was tempted and yet never sinned. And because of that, our help is outside of us. Our righteousness is outside of us. Our Savior is outside of us. It is Jesus Christ, and He is able to help you when tempted. And Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then, with confidence, draw near the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You do not have the resources left to yourself to live out Psalm 11, but Jesus does because he lived it. He was shot in the back, so to speak. He was crucified for our sins. His death in our place for our sins, redirecting God's wrath onto himself and redirecting his righteousness onto us by grace through faith. Jesus' conquering resurrection from the grave, he got up and his ongoing session seated next to the Father on the throne of the universe means that right now you have an advocate, a redeemer and friend with the Father, Son and Spirit against all your foes, against your Monday morning class and against your boss and your co-workers 
and against the temptations and taunts, Psalm 11 can't get erased from our Bibles. It's there. And there we discover, both in Hebrews and Psalm 11, that we have a willing Savior who in our neediness and our weakness beckons us, loves us, moves towards us in the gospel of grace to happily be our refuge and strength. Do you trust Jesus? Trust Jesus. Our ability to resist temptation and even our ability to rejoice in the Lord is outside of us and found in Christ. And so if we then go to be with Christ and found in Him as our Redeemer, then we can resist and rejoice by His strength that He provides. We can never lose it. We can never be, can never be taken from you. And there is a throne of grace that always smiles when you limp towards it. Friend, if you don't know Jesus today, He is speaking to you from His Word, calling you to renounce your sins, repent of them, and to believe and to be saved. Because He's done the work you can't do. So friend, cry out to Him in your heart, Lord, I am yours. Save me. And dear Christian, don't forget, God tests the righteous and he ever remains our refuge. This life is designed to always remind you and me that we don't need ourselves. We need the spirit of Jesus. Always. We are daily moving in or out of temptation and taunting. But God is using it for your good and his glory. So don't trust yourself. Trust Jesus. Lean on his church and find refuge in him. Amen? Lord, we, we thank you for the good gospel gift that Psalm 11 is, that old David is, and our good Savior Jesus Christ is. Lord, that you in your Son promised to never leave us nor forsake us. So Lord, help, help us this morning. Fortify our souls with your gospel grace. Lord, let us look to you and find refuge in you when temptations and taunts come. We pray this in Christ's name.